is a climate collab challenge. The contest was improving firewood for clean cook stoves. Um, and this excited me particularly because a lot of times in the clean cook stoves um, world, people are focused solely on the stove and not thinking so much about the fuel. So in my own research, we've done a lot of testing in the lab where everything is nicely controlled, and the clean firewood, um, um, things are well ventilated. But in reality, that's not always the case, right? So you may be in a kitchen with poor ventilation and people are often harvesting wood uh, that's wet or green. And we know that um, wet wood causes the efficiency to drop significantly and the emissions to increase as well. Um, so we have two winners here that we're gonna introduce uh, who have designed solutions to help address the uh, wet firewood issue. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the challenge and where this contest came from. So it was a collaboration between a Colombian NGO called Fondo de, uh, I forget, sorry about this, Fondo de Patrimonio Natural. natural. Um, and the online platform Minka Dev. Uh, and their goal was to work with communities in the Caribbean region of Colombia um, to co-create solutions to address uh, issues around deforestation in a national park that had be recently been developed. And these indigenous communities in this national park were under increasing pressure from high rates of tourism, more people coming to visit the park, and the requirements that are, are needed to meet those tourist needs to keep them fed and housed. So uh, the NGO discovered that up to about 500 kilograms of wood per day were being consumed recently to prepare meals for these tourists and they wanted to design a solution with the community to help address that issue um, and try to reduce those fuel consumption um, behaviors. So they designed a stove, but then quickly found that the stove was one part of the solution, but the, the, dry, the wet fuel being used um, hindered the performance of that stove. So that's how this contest came to be. There were about 10 proposals, I think, that were submitted, all very good proposals. And we have uh, two of the top proposals represented here. So I'm gonna briefly let those winners introduce themselves. Um, and then we'll actually watch their videos that they submitted with the proposal, um, followed by a Q&A. So we'll have a chance to ask questions to the winners. Um, and then we'll end with everyone breaking out into groups around each of the projects. Um, and to create a supportive environment for those teams. So. There are challenges, there are barriers, there are opportunities um, that each of these groups faces uh, moving forward with their project. We really wanna to try to support them as they move forward. So we have uh, James Grayson and Aditya Sujit. Um, and I'll let Aditya start out uh, with an introduction. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Aditya from Bangalore, India. I've come all the way from India to present my project here. My solution uh, proposes for modifying a gas cylinder into a cooking stove, and it can also solve multiple problems. I let the video do the talking. Great, thank you, Aditya. And uh, James, if you can hear us, can you uh, give us a quick introduction to yourself and your project? Yes, certainly. Um, so I'm I'm James Grayson. I run a, a blind spot think tank in England, which is mostly policy, but we also like to do some uh, practical work. Uh, most of that involves designing cook stoves that are then used to make biochar, which goes into compost uh, and into demonstration vegetable beds, where uh, we grow masses of vegetables that feed the people here uh, and also store carbon. Um, one of the things we found, of course, whenever you're making biochar is that you need incredibly dry wood or you need drier wood than you, you would normally have, for example, in your uh, your uh, fire or your wood stove at home. Mm. Um, you need uh, typically 14% moisture or less. And so this is one of our solutions that we developed for drying the wood before it can go into the cook stoves so you can make the biochar. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, James. Um, so now what we're going to do is actually see the three-minute videos that both Aditya and James prepared along with their proposals so we get a better sense of uh, what those entail. 
So can we run the videos, please? Thanks so much, James. That was a great video. Um, Aditya, we'll now queue up your video. Cost of credit, credit, and some hardware necessaries. 
As of now, I have a story idea, I have a product in microservices, and I have just run the um, private security in the real world on a real test data. I'm looking for product guys and expertise that can help me to turn to the right people. Here, the right people means people with unused abandoned gas cylinders or gas cylinder manufacturers, which can help me in the this project forward. The data that I'm doing is really more here. Can you over? <laughs>
we can start start with something that's very practical and tangible for people that you can actually get your hands on, something you can do at home. Um, and, and the particular advantage of the dry firewood is that you can not only use any old cook stove, you can use a particular cook stove which can make biochar. So it's a way of uh, storing carbon, which is a way of regenerating uh, topsoils, growing food in places where you couldn't grow it otherwise, potentially regrowing forests that wouldn't survive otherwise. Uh, and exploring the whole idea of not just reducing emissions, but actually finding ways to practically take carbon out of the atmosphere and keep it stored away somewhere useful, like in the soil or in increased forest growth. Uh, and and then after that, after you can, you know, after you get a sense that this is possible, because you can really do it for yourself at home. Um, then you can enter policy discussion and and actually, I think, potentially make much more progress than we could previously. Great. Yeah, thank you, James. Um, can you tell us a little bit, Aditya, about some of the major challenges or barriers? What are some of the specific things that, that your project is facing now that you're seeking help on, maybe from people in this room? Okay. Mm -hmm. Initially, it was challenging to convince people to think different, because gas cylinder is something that you don't uh, bring a mastic near it. So, so people will be thinking, right, what is this guy doing? Just putting, letting it on a fire, a gas cylinder, seriously. That's what, so even in the comment session initially, so people were asking it. So uh, I was able to convince most of them that uh, it's just uh, thinking different. Good, thank you. And for you, James, uh, major challenges or barriers on the project as, as of now? I guess the next step with this project, with dry firewood, would be to kind of open source the design to write it up in more detail. If somebody mm -hmm. wanted to make it for themselves, for example, you know, what kind of kitchen bin would they like to use and how do you join together the aerosol cans to go in the middle to make the tube? That, you know, that kind of practical detail and to get that up online uh, or in a mobile app so that people anywhere in the world can see it and use it for free. Uh, this is work that we're currently doing together with a, a U.S. NGO called 2050 Kids for the biochar cook stoves. And so, you know, if we can find interest in the drying chimney, this is something I'd like to see done for for the drying the firewood stage as well. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I'd like to open it up now. Does anyone else have questions for our presenters here? Yeah. Do you want folks to use the mic? Okay, so maybe I'll hand this around. There you go. Aditya, I, I, I couldn't. I couldn't see how your uh, um, how your equip, equipment was smokeless. It looked as if it had a chimney coming out the side. I, I'm afraid your in your your video the picture was up only for a couple of seconds. Could you explain that? Yeah. So Thank how you. this thing works is the uh, gas cylinder is cut on the side and a hinge door is placed. So that is the area where you will load the wood. So there is another port on the other side from where the smoke which is coming out is taken out through an exhaust port. So there is a pipe there. Oh, it's you have a pipe. Correct, to it. yeah. It goes outside yeah. And this pipe is always extendable to the chimney of the house. So whatever smoke is coming out, you can directly take it out, out of the house. Thank you. Good, thank you. Other questions? Yeah. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is it appears both systems burn something as a heat source. And I wondered if you had quantified you know, how much power is required to you know, uh, dry out a, you know, a, some, met some metric of, of wood. And then the second question was, you know, Many people in a traditional environment are used to doing things in a particular way. How do you convince them, you know, to adopt new technologies like these? So Thanks. answering your first question, the thing is that the longer you operate the firewood, the better the wood surrounding it will dry. That's the key. And taking up your next question is adaptation. Of into different communities. So since this is a portable gas cylinder, this is like a gas cylinder you can uh, carry it and place it wherever you want. So it is something you can fit in your kitchen or it is something that you can place anywhere. 
So it is easier in terms of adaptability. It is not a bulk device. So I think that makes it more adaptable. Okay. Do you, do you, just to kind of follow up on that, do you see a big behavior change that's required with this uh, along the lines of adoption? Um, no, I don't see. Like, that will I, I already told, like, mm -hmm. uh, normally people are putting two bricks and putting a firewood in between and leading a match. So it's much better. Mm -hmm. So I think people will, what do you call it, appreciate it because uh, it solves more, more, most of the problems that is associated with the former. Okay, good. So it will be a better option, I guess. And over to you, James. Um, any considerations of energy input and then also uh, the adoption issue surrounding the uh, technology? Uh, first, the energy input. I thought it may be interesting for people to actually see the wood. This is mm -hmm. about 250 grams of firewood that's previously been dried. So this, this is about the quantity that I would use for running the uh, drying chimney, for running the cook stove that then provides the heat for the drying chimney. And using that much uh, wood, you can burn the cook stove for about 20 to 25 minutes. And that should be enough to dry about eight kilos of firewood from about 20% down to under 10% moisture. Uh, if you're using wood chips, let's see if you can see the wood chips. This is a, a scoop of wood chips and you want about two scoops, which is roughly a liter or just under a liter of, of uh, wood chips to run, to run the thing, to do, to do one batch of firewood. And I, I'm sorry, I missed the second question. What, was, what else should I say? Uh, the, uh, there was a question regarding adoption of the technology. Do you foresee challenges or maybe major behavior changes associated with this? I, I think it's probably the kind of thing that might be best done as a self-organizing endeavor. You know, when people around the world, wherever they are, find that they've got some firewood, they need it to be drier. You know, maybe, they just, maybe they're just running a project of cook stove for tourists, or maybe they want to make biochar. So they'll find they've got a need. They'll go online or on their mobile phone, and, uh, and then hopefully in future they'll find the information to build one of these for themselves. Uh, and I guess at least in the short term, there's, uh, you know, the, there's these kit stainless steel kitchen bins that are found all over the world uh, that tend to be terribly badly made. Uh, but they also, on the other hand, once after they're thrown away, they make fantastic um, drying chimney, chimney cylinders. So you can convert this kind of rubbish into something that's very useful, mm. uh, which I guess is another form of adaptation. Great. Um, other questions from the audience? Yeah. I'm curious what sort of input um, either of you have had from um, any communities that do rely um, on this type of, of wood burning activity? You mean uh, what input I am seeking from the community right now? As of now, uh, I had discussed my ideas with uh, a lot of people back in India, and they are taking their input in uh, incorporating into my proposal. So, and going forward, I totally agree with James in making the proposal what you call the idea open source, so that anyone around the world can uh, just use it. It's just not like I am the only one who can use it. I'm just leaving it as an open source with most of my other ideas also, which is open source. So I'm looking for leads to people who could, uh, who has surplus uh, gas cylinders and who will be interested in uh, collaborating with me in taking this idea forward. James, did you hear that question? Yes, thank you. Um, the, there is, we're still at the beginning of the project for uh, crowdsourcing or open sourcing the uh, biochar cook stove designs and it hasn't been done with the drying chimneys yet. But I'm uh, hoping and looking forward to working with, together with the Columbia Natural Heritage Fund on applying the drying chimney design for their situation. Uh, the, the pilot work that we've done already with the biochar cook stove shows that it's actually very easy to take up in a, a range of different communities, both in developing and developed countries, uh, and that people are interested in a cook stove design that they don't have to buy, they don't have to pay for. They can make it themselves and they can use 
the uh, materials that are available locally, which is basically uh, used tin cans. Um, I think it's nice for the cooks that the cook stoves are basically smoke free. Um, that the should when they're when they're working properly with dry dry fuel or dry wood under fifteen percent. There should be no visible smoke. Um, but still, um, you know, you can use them outside. If if um, if you know if you have a chimney set up, you could use them indoors, as Aditya was saying as well. Uh, so so far in early stages, we've had a positive response, but we're looking forward to working with more communities around the world on the, on the cook stoves and on the drying chimney. Thank you. Okay, we have another question back here. Is there any heat regulator system or button if you need yeah, a yeah. steam uh, yeah, steam yeah, flame yeah. in the there. cooking process? Yeah. What is uh, no, it is there. Uh, how it works is the open part of the gas cylinder, um, it's cut out. So it can, uh, what do you call, uh, when you regulate it, it can enlarge and decrease. So based on that, you can control. And also there is other thing in the gas cylinder, it can, uh, there's an intake fan, which can regulate uh, the air that is supplied. That is an additional attachment. It is good to have. So it can regulate the amount of air that is entering inside this burning chamber. So based on that, you can regulate. So there is, when there is no air that is entering inside, then it will ultimately die off. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Um, and then did you, can we get a response from James on that too, in terms no. of temperature regulation? Yes, certainly. For the drying chimney, you, you don't really need temperature regulation. You just want a, a steady kind of six inch flame uh, running for the whole period, you know, 20 to th 20 to 30 minutes. But the other design that I work with, the biochar cook stoves, you, you can have quite a, a, a simple basic uh, heat regulation or flame regulation with that just by having a little piece of metal that covers over some of the primary air which is the air going into the uh, the charcoal making process at the base of the cook stove, so so you can have temperature or flame regulation with with the cook stove as well. Thanks. Great, thanks, Jen. Other questions from the audience? Yeah. I was wondering if you could uh, reach out to companies at like uh, like Rhino. They they make uh, propane tanks, and I I'm sure that they might be able to provide you with uh, ones that can't be used uh, recycled because that's usually how propane tanks are are given back to a store in America. They are uh, and to be refilled and reused, um, so that they could possibly help. Yeah. Thanks for that. Thank you. Do you have a response to that? that yeah. It's a good suggestion. And that is yeah. what I'm looking for. Good. Yeah. Um, great. Uh, I actually managed to yeah. talk with most of the people here during the other sessions. And good. there were people who were giving suggestions also, like to incorporate biogas into it, to keep a hole inside in the bottom of the gas cylinder. You can incorporate biogas into if you can bring a supply of biogas and you can incorporate it into this gas industry. Good. Other questions before we wrap up and move into a breakout sessions to help Aditya and James? Okay, I think we'll go ahead and do that. Um, so I think the idea is we have two spaces on either side of the room, uh, one for each of their projects. And it looks like is James' project over here and Aditya's is on this side. Um, so I think for folks who want to stick around and give a little bit more tailored support or learn a little bit more in detail about their projects, you can move over to those. I think we can just bring chairs over to them. And then we'll have James on a computer on this side. Is that right? Yeah.
Yeah. James, Hello. are you hearing us? Yes, I can hear you. Is that Julian? Perfect, yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's great. So, I think we can start. Yeah, but maybe you can sit here or something. No, you are participating? Ah, okay, okay, so it's just... uh, okay, so uh, okay, just a quick question, which is what sort of tools are required to manufacture your your uh, dryer? Uh, I think I used uh, I didn't I think as far from memory I didn't use any power tools. I used basically the same tools that I used for making the biochar cook stoves, uh, which are mostly sort of ordinary things like a pair of pliers, a screwdriver a few bolts. The only other tool that's a bit unusual is this guy here, which is a, an aviation type um, uh, tin snips. And they cost about, over here, they cost about between three pounds and 10 pounds, whether you, depending on whether you get a cheap pair or a, a fancy pair. So this, this was a fancy pair uh, that cost about 10 pounds. Um, and it's a, it's a right curving one. These aviation tin slips, you can get right right or left curving. And I get a right one because I'm, uh, sorry, uh, a left curving one because I'm right-handed. So it's easier to make the left type curves uh, when you're cutting the metal. Um, so if, if you didn't have one of those, you could use a, a power tool for, for the cutting as well. That would, that would also be fine if people have power tools instead. What are the fasteners used? Is it screws or just bent metal, or how do you tie it all together? At the moment, it's just bent metal. So the the main connection that that you would need to make is between the the metal tube that goes up through the center and the metal base. So you need a little hole in the metal base, uh, and I think all I did was uh, was bend some little flaps down when I cut the hole for the metal base. All the way around the hole, uh, and then and then the uh, the metal tube that goes up through the middle. That that at the moment it's just squished, in, just stuck in there because it's tight. Uh, but you could um, you could put a, a a a wire ring around there and tighten it, or if you got keen, you could put rivets in or bolts. But at the moment it's it's just sitting there. Uh, and that ha that actually has the advantage that you can move it up or down to uh, adjust the height of the of the um, the metal tube, and that controls uh, how much space there is at the top where the hot air is coming out, and before it goes down around the sides and through the wood. So, James, have you got have you got uh, a picture of this on on a website? That we we could see. Yes, of course. It's it's on the Climate CoLab uh, proposals website. If you go to the to the competition to the dry firewood competition, you'll find the um, you know one of the one of the two top entries there should be the dry the one that that uh, we're talking about. And there is there are pictures of it, um, uh, photographic pictures, and there's also a little design picture which should uh, probably have enough information if you wanted to try making one yourself great thank you you're, you're welcome and you're, you're also welcome to you know yell out if you if there's a question and it is something which is unclear with it okay could you talk a little bit more about biochar as a fuel i'm not familiar with that and how is it made and why is it better than firewood and things like that um, well, that, that's the funny thing is that biochar is actually just a, a, another word for charcoal. Oh, and what it means is that the charcoal, with the charcoal, you're doing something unusual. Instead of burning it like people usually do with charcoal, you're doing anything but burning it, which is uh, why you get a different name. So it's basically, it's, it's charcoal that's called biochar because you're not burning it. Uh, and that means it's not actually a fuel for the for the cook stoves. It's a byproduct. It's something that's left over after you've done the the cooking, after you've done the burning with the the cook stove. Let me see if I can show you a show you some here. This is this is some of the biochar. Is that is that visible at your end? 
Yeah. And, and that's actually the amount of biochar that's left over after using the cook stove once. So that's for about 20 or 25 minutes of cooking. It would be, I think, about 80 to 100 grams of uh, charcoal. So here's, here's a couple of pieces uh, up close. And of course, you could use that for burning. You could, you could use it in a, in a cook stove or a, or a barbecue to, to burn and do some cooking with. But actually, what's interesting to do with it is as, to keep it as a store of carbon. And there's quite a wide variety of things you can do with it as, as a store of carbon. But the kind of basic, most standard and most interesting use to start with would be to put it into compost. Uh, and that help, helps the compost to work. The compost will burn fast, will, will cook down faster, and it'll be more aerobic you'll get a better quality of compost. But also, after the compost is finished, you've got the biochar mixed in with it. So it becomes a way of adding the nutrients of the compost uh, and the biochar to your soil at the same time. So your soil becomes a, a carbon store, both with the compost and with the biochar. And the biochar is non-biodegradable. So it ends up staying in the soil for hundreds or thousands of years. And then as well as the, the benefit of the compost being in your soil, you get the added benefits from the biochar um, because the biochar is um, helping the soil as a, uh, structurally. So you get more air in there. It'll absorb water and drain water better than it did before. But it also works biochemically better than it did previously. So it, the, um, the biochar works in particular as a store of nutrients. It'll hang on to nutrients that it finds from the compost or from, uh, you know, even if you're using synthetic fertilizers, they'll be tend to be stored in the, you know, the that um, massive fine pore structure of the charcoal. Um, but then when the car, when the plant roots are needing the uh, the nutrients, the biochar will release them. So you get a symbiotic relationship between the plant roots and the biochar. And you also tend to get an increase in yet another form of carbon store, which is mycorrhizal fungi. And the mycorrhizal fungi will be living uh, with the biochar, sometimes in the biochar, but also in the soil. And they'll act as a transport mechanism between the biochar and the plant roots. So that's, that's the biochar. So, do you have to pound the biochar down so it's in smaller pieces before you add it to the compost? What well, you you can do, yes. Um, I tend to quite often for the cook stove use uh, uh, chunks of wood which have been run through uh, a wood chipper or a wood shre a sh wood shredder. So this is this is what the fuel looks like. Let's see if you can see that. And what that what that means is that you end up with pieces of biochar which are typically quite small. So here's, here's some of the biochar which is made uh, from the, the wood chunk or wood chips. And that's fine actually, that size, you know, sort of two centimeters and, and less. It's fine to use that size as it is without breaking it down any further. Uh, but what you could do if you had um, larger pieces of biochar, because you're using larger pieces of firewood, you could crush them a bit by walking on them and probably what I would do then is I would sieve it through a kind of an inch type uh, size mesh. And then the larger pieces I would use either for um, putting in the bottom of large pots or for um, the, the drainage in, um, in raised beds where you want to pr provide some kind of water store uh, or in water purification systems. And then use the small pieces to go into compost and into the soil. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Say, I've I've got I've got a Russian fireplace. I don't know whether you've heard about those. Ru a Russian fireplace. Russian. That means it's from Russia. It doesn't mean it's in a hurry. No. <laughs> As a matter of fact, it does mean it's in a hurry because it's, <laughs> instead of normal uh, wood burning stoves like we have in the, uh, New England. Um, it, 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 it burns in a short while, so the, the whole, the, the, the fire that heats the Russian fireplace for either 12 or um, um, 24 hours heats all the bricks of 
like the Russian fireplace. It only burns in two hours. So you give it as much air as you want. And I end up with ash, not biochar. Yes. And so I, I suppose the biochar comes with an absence of oxygen. Is that is that correct? That, that's right. I mean, you. It is possible to make to make biochar in a normal uh, wood stove, because quite often, when you, if in particular, if you've got a glass front and you can see it working, you'll you'll see the the fuel wood in there at a certain stage will look look like charcoal, so it, it won't look like wood anymore. And if you take it out and put it into um, into a, a saucepan with a lid or into uh, like a biscuit jar, a biscuit tin with a lid, and you exclude the oxygen, then when it cools down, you'll have usable biochar. Uh, it's also possible to put wood in into a tin in your wood stove, uh, and then just heat it up using you know using other the the normal fire in other parts of the wood stove, and then you'll end up with something again like biochar. Uh, but the usual way to make biochar is, is in some kind of cook stove or a kiln that's adapted to, to, do a, to do what you said, which is to exclude the oxygen during the process of burning. Um, you can do that with what's called a retort, which is to, um, to hold the fuel wood in a container and light another fire underneath it, which creates the heat that, that, drive, that heats up the fuel wood to above 200 degrees, uh, and then it creates wood gases and you're left with um, with just the uh, just the, the charcoal afterwards, but the more efficient way of doing it is to to use a kind of cook stove, which doesn't require the sacrifice of any kind of fuel wood to burn off, to create the heat to burn off the wood gas, because you're actually making wood gas from the entire um, the entire furnace full. The, the whole stock of wood is converted into charcoal, um, and and you you just you just because of the way the cook stove is designed, you're you're excluding most of the the primary air or most of the air from from the burning process. Uh, and and that's that's the type of cook stove which which uh, I use as the um, as the um, the fuel source for the drying chimney. So here's here's one of the here's one of the cook stoves that I use. That's that's the outside of the cook stove. But, but there, are, there are other designs for biochar cook stoves as well. Um, the, the one that I, I use is just chosen because it's particularly simple to design and you can use uh, tin cans to make it from, which is easier than, than fabricating it from sheet metal or uh, trying to, to weld or rivet stainless steel. So what's bad in the smoke from wet wood? I mean, is it unburned? basically hydrocarbons that are emitted at that point that don't once the wood is dry you're, you're asking about the steam the the smoke or the steam that you could see coming off in the video from the drying chimney is that is that right well actually i'm asking I mean, if people you know cook over with wet wood right i mean i've, I've had the experience of uh, campfire and it's annoying to, to get it in your face but what what's bad about it specifically in other words you know, what chemicals get released and, and what, what are the hazards of wet wood versus dry wood? Yes, I guess, I guess the first thing about wet wood is that it's just, it's just quite inefficient. So the largest proportion of the smoke that you see coming off the wet wood fire, you know, whether it's a campfire or whether it's a cook stove, is going to be steam. Uh, and uh, the steam will have little particles of, um, of ash and uh, unburnt hydrocarbons, as you say, and also unburnt, uh, unburnt wood gases, which is carbon, carbon monoxide uh, and uh, carbon dioxide and hydrogen. Um, but but it ten, it, the, the first thing, I guess, is just that it's very inefficient. So you, you've got, um, whenever you can see steam coming off in the smoke, it means that your fire is having to use up a lot of its heat, just, um, just boiling off the water that's in the wood. And so that whether you're dealing with an open fire or a cook stove, you, you would generally want to not be seeing any visible steam. You want the wood to be going into, the, your, into your burn dry enough that you're not having to, uh, to waste much of the energy 
in um, in in uh, evaporating or or boiling off the water that's in your fuel. So if you've got a, a good functioning cook uh, cook stove or a good functioning uh, a wood stove or open fire, there shouldn't really be any visible uh, steam coming off from smoke. So that means that if you're still seeing smoke, that's because there's an inefficiency in the burning process, which is going to be uh, some unburned hydrocarbons. It's going to be wood gases, which are created through the, the fuel wood being heated up, but, n but not enough, um, either not enough air or not enough heat applied to the, burning, to the burning wood gas to make sure that the wood gas is properly burnt off. And that means that if you've got dry wood, for example, going into a cook stove mm -hmm. uh, and you can see some, uh, some smoke coming off, um, then that means that the wood gas is not really being burnt efficiently. And that, that would then be a design problem in the cook stove. Or you could say it's a design problem in the, um, the wood stove if it's, a, uh, if it's a, a stove that you're using inside your house. And that's typically solved by... Uh, by in improving or increasing the flow of preheated secondary air. You know, in quite often in a wood stove that you have in your house, you'll see a little flap for adjusting the, the airflow near the top of the, the wood stove. And that's intended just to improve the efficiency of the burn. So that the wood gas that's created by the normal process of burning doesn't go up the chimney, but it gets burned within the, the, co within the wood stove. Uh, and if that and if that's happening effectively, you shouldn't see any visible smoke coming off uh, if you're putting dry firewood in. Yeah. We just have a few. Mm. Okay, one last question. That is, what are the gases that come out of out of your flue? Out, out of out of the charcoal burner. Have you have you uh, measured what gases are actually coming out yes. at all? So from from what what you call the charcoal burner is actually a charcoal maker. So it the the, the intention of the design and the process of using it is to generate charcoal. Yeah. But you were asking about the exhaust gases that come out when you're doing that. Yeah. And so long as you're putting some reasonably dry firewood or fuel wood in which is, in the case of a biochar cook stove, that means fi uh, under 15% moisture levels, 14% uh, or less, then there should be no visible smoke. That means that the amount of steam in there is going to be very small. There might still be some steam in there, but it's, so, it's such a, slow pr a low proportion that actually you can't see it. Uh, and there also, you, you shouldn't be getting unburnt hydrocarbons or unburnt wood gases because... In a, a, a decent biochar cook stove, you should always have uh, a, a decent flow, you know, a, a sufficient flow of preheated secondary air, which is a, a flow of air that's designed to come in next to the cook stove and next to the area where the burn is happening, so it gets heated up. And then it gets mixed with the wood gases, and the wood gases and the secondary, the preheated secondary air flows, they mix together and they, they burn together. So actually, the wood gas actually Im improves in its flammability. It becomes better to burn after it's mixed with the secondary air. And then when it's coming out, you, you should more or less only be getting carbon dioxide. You shouldn't really be getting anything which is unpleasant to breathe or dangerous. And I've tested that with a, a sort of domestic carbon monoxide um, alarm which, you know, you can get the alarms which actually show you the measurements of the, the parts per million in carbon monoxide. And generally when, when the machine, when the, the cook stove is running and there's no visible smoke as, as it should be, the, there's, there's pretty close to no detectable carbon monoxide. So the short answer to your, your question is that the, the exhaust is more or less just carbon dioxide. Uh, and in terms of the proportions, ab about half the carbon that was in the fuel is ending up going, uh, being lost as carbon dioxide. So that has to be reabsorbed in new plant growth, which means that there is, you know, the, the give you a good reason to be planting uh, crops to grow food or planting trees to make the next lot of fuel. Um, but also half of the carbon that was originally in your fuel is retained as uh, as a stored carbon in the biochar. 
So that's the carbon that, that actually becomes the carbon positive part or the you know, negative emissions part that goes into your compost and into your soil. Thank you. Have uh, measured what the, the net of the drying and then consuming the dried wood is in terms of useful heat versus burning the wet wood. I mean, is it actually more efficient to dry it first and then use the dry food fuel versus just burning the wet fuel and ignoring the bad gases that come out? I would expect that I haven't I haven't actually done a calculation or a test for that in practice, but I would expect that it would be worthwhile burning the small amount of wood that it takes to run the drying chimney. Just because you can get such a big increase and such a big improvement in the dryness of the wood in a short period of time. So just running the cook stove on, say, about 250 grams of wood, which is which is not very much. That's um you know, that's basically this this kind of handful of wood that we were looking at earlier. Um, using that much wood enables you to, to get dry firewood, uh, to dry about eight kilos of dry firewood. And I think you end up with, I'm quite, not quite sure of the cal actual calculation, about seven kilos after it's dried because you, you're reducing the weight of the firewood just by drying it. You, know, you haven't got the weight of the, the water anymore in the firewood. But I guess probably the, the main reason for, for going to the trouble and using up the firewood in, in the drying process is that then when you come to, to use the, the firewood, you know, whether it's in an open fire or a cook stove or a biochar cook stove, it's just a much nicer process. So you, you can end up with smoke you know, or exhaust, which are, have no visible, no visible vapors in them. There's no, there's no, um, there's no burnt, unburnt hydrocarbons. There's no steam in there. Uh, you know, you, you can be cooking without any visible smoke whatsoever, um, and Sorry. Uh, and and that means that you know you're not bothering neighbours, you're 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 not uh, you're not having to breathe the stuff, and you're not having to worry about carbon monoxide and, and other nasty stuff while while you're cooking. James, sorry, this is Dan. Uh, I'm gonna Hi, have Dan. To, I'm gonna have to cut off here. We're we're uh, moving into the next session shortly, so. Maybe if folks wanted to follow up with you, what's a good way to do that? Just Probably the e easiest is Twitter because I'm I'm looking at that every day. So if you if you do a search on Twitter for climate rescue or for blind spotting, you you'll find a funny looking guy with a, a cook stove in the picture. And so feel free if you use Twitter to uh, you know to ask me whatever you like. And thank you very much for for taking part and, and being here and asking great questions. Thank you, Ron.